Sounds so good. Boral is an old friend of ours. He uh, initially started to work in HIV, worked at Hopkins, went to the NIH and started to work in cancer. And he's back in the HIV arena uh, with um, a group called Caring Cross, which is a nonprofit gene therapy um, um, manufacturer. And he can tell you what part of that process they manufacture when he starts to, to, to pre present. But we also know him from the Global Gene Therapy uh, Initiative, and uh, which is also about bringing um, cell and gene therapy to uh, low and middle income countries, as is Karen Cross. And this is his passion. He is he's amazing for what he's been able to accomplish, and the different sorts of um, of um, a, a delivery system that he has worked out that will really make a difference to people in low and middle income countries. So, Bora, was there anything else you want to add to that? No, I think it's um, good. You know, I mean, you're very kind and you asked me to talk about, you know, Caring Cross and its model, you know, and um, in this particular talk, I won't talk um, in any great detail on our HIV gene therapy candidate because Remus um, pr presented that, I think, in a, in a meeting before. I will touch upon it. And so I, I prepared here a, a different kind of a talk where, you know, I'll share with you my personal story and journey in academia and biotech and 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 how that journey led to both myself and and Remus Orentis, my co-founder at Caring Cross, who also had a similar story, how we came to found a nonprofit that we named Caring Cross and how and the goal of the nonprofit to tackle the issues of access for these cell and gene therapies. So that's what I'll be covering today and I hope that's okay. Perfect. So um, you let me know when I can start. Yeah, oh, you can you can ready. share your slides. All right, share slides. And everyone, remember, you can use the chat feature to write your questions, or if you have another question, just raise your hand, and we can um, interrupt at any time. Yeah, please, uh, yeah, Michael, if you could just, um, you know, interrupt, or somebody could interrupt me. Sure, we will. Live. Great. So again, thanks very much um, for inviting me to talk about um, something I am very passionate about, um, trying to create know, uh, avenues for improved access because these therapies are proving to be quite expensive to produce. And so that's the idea around Caring Cross, enabling affordable access. So we call advanced medicines. Great. Um, so a little bit about my background. I have a, I'm a virologist by training and i um, from the University of Western Australia. Um, and w in my PhD days, I, I worked on in the tropical kind of diseases, worked on um, their molecular Killer and and, and uh, tropism aspects, but my story I think starts a little bit before that with with my father, um, and my father uh, grew up in communist Yugoslavia, and um, and at that time, um, you know he had to um, he he was a a, a student working um, in a technical school and studying. Uh, he was quite good in his grades, and he was approached by the Communist Party members, and uh, they told him that, um, you know, we really want you to become a member of the of the Communist Party. And if you indulge me a little bit, it will come apparent when I'm talking about my dad's story here. Um, and um, he was, uh, he's a Christian, and um, very good, difficult for him to join the Communist Party, you have to renounce your faith. And so they kept on bugging him. They said, you know, unless you, you know, join the Communist Party, you will not be able to finish school. And so at one point, I remember him telling me he was in Sarajevo trans train station. This is in the early 1950s. And he got his papers to report to the local Communist Party um, office. And in the train station, he went to the toilet and he basically ripped up the papers and flushed them down the toilet. Um, and so then he made his way um, from Sarajevo to the borderland up here. And it's a long story. I'm not going to tell you about the story um, in detail, but um, he crossed the border. Um, he was hunted by dogs at some point and then eventually crossed over into Italy, into a, into a refugee camp where he was there for a year. Um, he had the opportunity to go to other countries, but the, the fast track was to go to Australia. He was very happy that Australia was going to allow him to come in. And Back then, um, you know, a migrant coming in, he didn't get any degree work. He had to do all the jobs that nobody else would take. You know, he hunted pigs, hunted crocodiles, cut sugarcane, um, transported materials across Australia. And I asked him in his older age, you know, you know, they wanted to make you a big man in Yugoslavia. You could have been, a, you know, in the Communist Party, really wealthy, you know, all that. And you substituted that for, 
you know, a life that was a lot more humble. You know, um, it was um, a life that uh, we were a low middle income uh, family, um, you know, uh, modest in terms of our, you know, the uh, our housing and everything. And he said, no, I'd never would substitute anything because, um, you know, I was able to practice my faith in Australia freely um, and, um, and and nothing can replace that. And so that made it quite an impression on me that my dad, because of his principle, you know, no matter what it is, whether it's faith or whatever, um, gave up a lot of opportunity and 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 uh, made a, a living for us and our family so that we could live freely, so that I could get educated, so that I had the opportunity to come to the United States and be a scientist. And so it really impressed upon me the importance of, of principle and giving back. Because when we live in countries like Australia and in the United States, we are so, so lucky. And it's important for us to always keep that in mind. So that's a little bit why it, the social justice piece has always been with me. And, and one of the reasons why Caring Cross, I think, was, was formed. Um, and so after um, my, I, uh, my, my work at, in Australia, I, I was very fortunate to come to the NIH. I was at the NAID. I started working in an in a area that I started to love from the beginning, gene therapy from HIV infection. This was in the late 1980s. Developed some retroviral vectors to inhibit HIV in, in T cells. And at that time, we were at the very early days, but we demonstrated feasibility that elements like ribozymes and antisense could inhibit HIV replication, that this ther this strategy for gene therapy for HIV truly had merit. And then I, I left um, uh, um, uh, the NIH and, and joined as a junior faculty member at, at Johns Hopkins. And, and the concept that I had in the, at that time was, what if we could use HIV against itself? What if we could turn HIV into a vector, and others had been working on HIV as a vector system at that time as well, but what if we could use that vector, get it into cells and inhibit HIV in a very efficient manner? It turns out that HIV is a very stealth vector. It turns out that actually it turns out to be a very good vector in which now there are approved products using, using HIV uh, lentiviral vectors. And back at that time, we showed proof of concept that a HIV could inhibit HIV, uh, using what we had at that time, a ribosome. And we published that in, in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences back in 1996. Now, the conundrum was is how to fund future development. You had this proof of concept study. And, you know, in terms of getting grants to develop things, that wasn't really what grants were for. They were really generally at that time for innovative, you know, kind of work and not development. So around that time, 1994, I did seek alternative funding mechanisms. And then a new a tool arrived at that time. It was called the internet, the World Wide Web. So during the day, I was doing my lab work and, 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 and working on bench experiments and during the night, uh, trying to climb a very steep learning curve in order how to present a concept uh, around a company to actually you know, develop the therapy going forward. And, and I was very fortunate. Um, um, I was able to get funding for Rexus company that I founded back in 1999. But at the time, I must tell you, starting a biotech company from, from Hopkins, much like it was much felt like going to the dark side. You know, um, um, it was the money, but you're, you're leaving academia. But we were successful in developing a HIV vector um, that efficiently included HIV replication. And we then started the very first lentiviral vector clinical trial. Uh, it was a long process working with the FDA and others. <laughs> processes for lentiviral vectors. And then the trial that we established at safety using a HIV vector against HIV is the basis. You know, a lot of the specifications that we did in that trial are specifications that are even used today um, for the release uh, of lentiviral vectors. But at that time, that first generation HIV vector that we created did not cure HIV. <laughs> now, now why? We learned a lot and we moved on. Uh, but I also learned my very first lesson about companies and how they're funded and how the innovator can quickly lose control and how a company can go in a direction that the founder or innovator does not necessarily want to go in. Uh, because... <laughs> Uh, can we please mute our lines if you're not speaking? Thank you. I got him. Yeah, great. Um, uh, so I learned my first lesson that sometimes there's a disconnect between, say, what an investor or would want from a company 
and exit a, um, a, a rate, high rate of return compared to what is really required over the long term to develop an effective therapeutic product. So in a nutshell, there was a disconnect there. I left my first company, learned a lot, and started my second company, um, Lentigen. Um, and, I, and unfortunately, at that time, I did have a non-compete. So I was forced not to work in the HIV space for a number of years, focused on cancer, but then we had some successes on cancer, actually. We developed a vector that eventually became the vector used for Kimraya, the very first FDA-approved gene therapy product, proving that HIV vectors, this case in the, in the case of treatment for cancer, can be a very effective delivery system to get into T cells and have therapeutic effects. Now, this was in the post-2008 financial crisis days in which we could not gain a lot of traction. Uh, the amount of investment was very small. And so the, the best solution, and, and I piloted the, the acquisition, was that Lentigen was acquired by Multani Biotech. And um, I was hoping that a, a, a company like Multani Biotech that had decentralized machines and, and um, would be much more long-term um, in terms of being able to work, work in the um, impact space. And we developed a very successful contract business. We developed a pipeline of car products for um, cancer. We piloted an anti-HIV duo car that, that you'll see here again um, at Lentigen. Um, but then I left in 2021. I, I learned again that when you have a company and its, and its mission is to make money, it is very difficult to sort of like change the direction and, and really get a lot of resources for impact causes, which I tried very hard to do, but I was not successful. So left in 2021 to co-found Caring Cross, a nonprofit. Why a nonprofit? Okay, well, as I mentioned, for profit companies have the return on investment as the goal. Impact is secondary, if at all, right? And it's very difficult to get shareholders to agree to impact goals, particularly for CC corporations. If you want to do some sort of impact work like discount pricing or something, you have to get every single shareholder to agree. And I can tell you that all you need is one or two shareholders not to agree. And if you try to do it, then you get sued or you get removed from the board. So it's very, very difficult to do that under that kind of a, a situation. So my thought was, is could we create value and impact by more intelligently dividing up the pie? Whether we're working with companies or starting new companies, there's always a company pie, right? And there is the part of the pie that's very, very important to investors. And there's part of the pie that's really not important to investors. It's usually a small slice of the pie. But nevertheless, if you could take that small slice of the pie and use it for impact, you're moving the needle, right? So, so we create a caring cross under this idea that of a nonprofit that partners with existing companies because we have knowledge, we have knowledge in this space and we can help companies move their products forward. Or we can start new companies in a different way, right? And the basis of that is actually agreements. Agreements that are created. Hold on, um, hold on, please. Um, could everyone mute? No. Thank you. Hold on. Okay. Sorry, Boris. Uh, sorry, no worries. No worries. It's perfectly fine. We create agreements that are created with the company. So if it's a, if it's another company, we say, hey, we'll help you, but we want this little slice of the pie for an impact reason. I'll explain that in just a little bit. Or if we create a company, we can bake it into the charter of the company. And I'm going to mention B corporations in a minute that that company has to devote part of its resources for impact causes. Right. So that's the way we do it. But a nonprofit can do it because a nonprofit can then incubate the technologies and then create those clauses and those agreements for the for profit company it either collaborates with or it creates. So let me give you some examples. So, for example, a B Corporation, the, the first spin out company of Caring Cross is Vector Biomed, a vector CDMO company. We created it as a B Corporation. And what that means is, is in the, the charter of the company, we have to devote a certain proportion of its capacity and discount pricing for low and middle income countries and for underserved populations. I'll explain that in a little bit more detail. But there are other examples. I mean, there's no one, you know, one um, plan fits all. You could um, divide the pie between the rights in high income countries versus rights to practice in low and middle income countries or, or provide discount for underserved populations in high income countries and those in low and middle income countries. Discounts across the board or special discounts for special products that you identify that are separate for low-middle-income countries 
while there's another product that is really for high income countries, right? Variants on the product. And also other ways to do it is to maybe um, after the product is approved, you make an agreement that, um, to say that, listen, the product is approved and you can sell it at a certain price, but we're going to keep a clinical trial open in perpetual perpetuality for those that are uninsured, that they can always have access to this under a, under a clinical trial. So these are kind of the ways, and this is by no means a, an exhaustive list. There are other ways to do this as well. But that's the way we kind of think about conceptually on how we create these partnerships, these relationships with companies. And we have quite a few of them. Um, so, you know, Caring Cross here, our goal is affordability and accessibility. We sort of see, see ourselves as a think tank. We're thinking through these problems. Incubating technologies, we work with universities and, and other groups in terms of taking their technologies to the next level and also accelerating candidates. So you can see the number of, you know, several of the collaborations that we have here with different kinds of institutions um, on the, on the uh, non-profit side. And on the for-profit side, um, we have relationships with companies. We have a partnership with Sativa, a partnership with the BAS, CIF, and, um, and we created our first company, Vector Biomed, which is a vector CDMO company. Because the vector, if you're looking at price and cost for these gene therapy products, the vector is the big gorilla in the room. If you can really reduce the cost of the vector, you can dramatically reduce the cost of the product. So, um, and, and always these relationships always have some sort of impact value associated with it, some clause, um, either discount pricing, whatever we can do to move the needle. So coming back to these gene therapy products, they've been successful in a clinic. These are the approved CAR-T ones for the treatment of leukemia, lymphoma, multiple myeloma. And now we have products for stem cells that are quite successful. Um, the uh, Zimblengo from Blueberry Bio, a stem cell for beta thalassemia that will also be released for sickle cell disease. And then a number of genetic diseases that are now being treated using a similar method. So this is a, a these products are all autologous products, right? That means you're, and they're called ex vivo, quote unquote, where you're taking cells from a patient, you add or a participant or a um, um, and you add the vector, now usually a lentiviral vector, if it's a hemopoietic cell, into the T cell or the, or the stem cell. And then that gene modified cell is then infused back into the patient. Now, all the approved products that you see here are all ex vivo, right? That means they're taking out cells. There is discussion about other products, like, for example, allogenate products. We don't take the cells from the patient, patient or participant. You take it from another donor, and then you make the product. So far in the cancer space, they're not proving to be as effective as autologous. It seems that taking cells from a patient or a participant and infusing it back in are the most um, effective products to date. There is also the talk about in vivo products. That means instead of taking the vector and taking the cells out and adding the vector to the cells, let's inject the vector directly into the body where the cells are and have the effect. There have, there have been no clinical trials um, using uh, vectors for CAR T cells, for instance, that have shown any promise in clinical trials as yet. There have been some animal studies, mainly in immunodeficient mice, but nothing successful. There's a lot of work being done on it. A lot of, a lot of investments are being made into this space to create in vivo vectors because of the belief that injecting the vector directly will be cheaper than um, this ex vivo method. Although that may be true. But I think we can do a lot, and that's what we're trying to do, to decrease the cost, make this very simple, make this very inexpensive. And, and, and the thing that should really drive us in terms of these therapies is what works the best. If ex vivo is the safest, most efficacious product, that should be the product, right? Not to push some envelope somewhere to hope that a product may be better in the future. Let's work on products that work, whether they're ex vivo or in vivo. So that's, that's my two cents on that. Uh, did, uh, Linda, did you want to comment on that? Because I know we talked about this beforehand. Did you want to go into any greater detail? Because I wasn't going to bring up any additional information on ex vivo versus in vivo. I was going no, to I think that. this is fine. I mean, I just think that it's, you know, it's yeah. come up and that you've addressed it perfectly. Right. Remember, um, these vectors are viruses, right? And so when you inject viruses in the body of an immunocompetent host, that will react to that, right? And with AAV vectors, we've seen that. Systemic injection of AAV vectors have caused a lot of toxicity. So while um, that future for in vivo vectors is promising, um, it's very um, 
it, it certainly would be a more a cheaper product. I think there's still a high bar to, to make that product and make it efficacious in an immune competent host. That's why I'm a, I, I still think that there's a lot of merit to ex vivo because with ex vivo, you can condition the individual and create space and, and have a product that is very characterized before putting it in. It is more expensive, but the cost, I think, we can actually make inroads into the cost over the long term. But nevertheless, I mean, obviously, there are going to be parallel paths, and they all have merit. Burrow, but, we had a question. Um, yeah, please. Someone was asking, um, what are the main challenges for setting up to NFP status for gathering funds to launch and for sustainability? You mean for Exivo in particular? Is that what the question is I about? I assume or... that's what they're referring to, yes. Yeah. Yeah, no, so I think have... she just meant the challenges of, of a nonprofit corporation versus the regular corporation. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. So, you know, we will partner, you know, um, going forward, right? We'll create, you know, if the nonprofit has enough funding to move it forward, we'll move it forward or we'll find an investment. And there are many mechanisms that you could use in order to share value through a nonprofit or create a company and share value that way. Um, but the stipulations have to be access, right? So that that will be the finding the right investors in order to invest in such um, companies in order so they get the value that they want. And yet we can make sure that as many people can be treated with these therapies as possible. But in the model that I'm going to be describing here in just a minute, you'll see how we attempt to tackle the ex vivo cost issue. And can I just say, I think that, that uh, I think that Patricia might have meant establishing one sort of company versus another. And, you know, there are a lot more hurdles for a nonprofit. There are a lot more procedures that you have to, to um, apply to your business, but it's not insurmountable, you know. And if you have a good lawyer, it's easy. It happens every day, so. Yeah, and uh, Tom had a question. Tom, do you want to unmute and ask your question? Sure, thank you. Or I was just wondering if you, um, foresee and any potential impact on future funding now that the federal government congress has authorized medicare to begin to negotiate lower prices for specific drugs and and we know that e commercial health plans peg their reimbursement rates to medicare rates so this will over time may ripple through the entire healthcare industry do you, do you foresee any impact on on future funding yeah, I think it's a wonderful development personally, and uh, I hope that we can even do more. You know, what I'm hoping for actually that you could get uh, reimbursed even during clinical trials under under a situation where you're capping pricing to make it affordable, that perhaps either payers or the government would be willing to sponsor and, and support such clinical trials because they get value at the very end, right, rather than and, and help move those therapies forward. So yeah, I, I would applaud, I'm applauding what's been done and I hope more can be done um, in order to, because a lot of the innovation actually occurs at academic medical centers, right? Um, and if that network can be supported for further innovation with the proviso that you cap the, the price, um, much more less expensive, um, you know, a tenth or a fifth of the cost of the current therapies, then I think that model would pay itself over time. That's what we are actually suggesting. But the price today is very expensive, right? The approved products, it's at least $350,000 per patient, not including the clinical costs. And we know that such pricing is really not sustainable for insurance companies or health systems over the long term. They do it now mainly because of the limited number of patients um, that are being treated for these oncology products. Um, very limited number is quote unquote like an orphan disease, right? Um, it's not sustainable if you're going to start treating tens of thousands of patients uh, with these kind of pricing. It's certainly not feasible in low middle income countries. And so, you know, such pricing really restricts access, particularly for underserved populations. And you don't have to go far to find underserved populations. Um, this slide, I think, tells you everything that how CAR T cell therapy has been utilized by race from 2016 to 2021. Almost 80% of all the individuals receiving CAR T cell therapy between that time were white. Right. So this already shows you that even in the United States, there's disproportionate access to these therapies and, and, and underserved populations are, are not getting these therapies in the numbers that they should be. So what's the reason for the high price? OK, um, 
pharmaceutical companies that make them have a drug model in their mind. They want to provide the final product, the final drug product that's shipped out and and um, um, to the hospital for infusion. And, and that requires a centralized manufacturing facility, which is expensive, it's inefficient, and has limited scalability. I'm not going to go into the great details, but this is how these cells are, are shipped and shipped back. And, and there's a huge cost associated with it. So you go to hospital, the, 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 the patient, oncology um, um, center, a patient um, undergoes an apheresis. That product is then shipped to a centralized manufacturing facility for each company. Each company sets up uh, its own manufacturing facility. That really drives up the cost. Um, then that product is manufactured and shipped back, right? And this logistical line is very, very expensive. Facility cost is very expensive. And um, I'm not going to go into great detail, but this really drives up the price um, for centralized manufacturing. What really would increase efficiencies is point of care, right? This increases the efficiencies and dramatically reduces the cost for a fraction of the cost. We believe that it can be done for a tenth of the cost. If you do very conservative numbers, it's a fifth of the cost, but we believe that it could be done for a tenth of the cost. And these facilities may are either at the hospital or very close to the hospital. And this simple logistics with simple processes leads to greater efficiencies and reducing the overall cost. And the FDA likes this model, right? So much so that it's now even for drug manufacturing of drugs, it's talking about distributive manufacturing and point of care models, let alone for um, autologous um, cell therapy, which makes total sense to do it in proximity. Uh, to patient care. And if you look at the most recent draft guidance for CAR T cell products in March 2022, it's laden with avenues for decentralized manufacturing. And uh, the UK is moving in that direction. We had a co consultation for point of care manufacturing, and the EMA, EMA is going in this direction. And I can tell you, when you talk to in particular to low income countries, this is the only way that they can go. They can't see how a centralized manufacturing paradigm would work in those countries. So the FDA and other regulatory agencies, the first thing they're going to ask you, fine, you want to do decentralized manufacturing, prove to us that you can make it at all these different sites consistently, because that's the big deal, right? Can you make the product consistently? Because what the centralized manufacturing facility says, oh, we can make it consistent in one site, right? Can you make it consistent between different sites? And so that's why we published this paper back in Nature Communications back in December of 2021, where we had a typical CAR-19, this is your typical CAR, the approved products, and we had two disparate sites, one in Moscow, Russia, pediatric trial for kids with leukemia, and then in Cleveland, Ohio, at Case Western Reserve University, an adult uh, trial um, for lymphoma. And what we found, the bottom line was, is that when you have the same device, the same vector, the same materials used to manufacture, well, guess what? The product is highly similar, no matter whether it's pediatric patient material, right, or adult, right? And this is just one of the patients here on this trial, a, a patient uh, with follicular lymphoma. You can see this is the tumor of what's lighting up before and 90-day post-car therapy. These are, you know, transformative therapies for these patients. And in contrast to the approved products, which take about, you know, three weeks to manufacture, um, and, and that means about 10% of the patients never get the therapy because they have advanced disease. We were able to, in this trial, show an eight-day vein-to-vein time, which meant that every single patient got treated and all the patients had great outcomes. So we were very excited proving this point. And I think the FDA has, has really uh, taken this and other now publications um, and using it as a reference. A little bit more color around the CAR T for leukemia and lymphoma. So this is the team at Case Western um, using what was then the Prodigy device, but now there are other devices that can be used, cheaper, better, simpler. Um, and, and this is the, uh, the PI in Moscow. These are two pediatric patients um, that were on our trial, two separate families. And you can see the overall response rates at the Case Western Reserve trial, you know, 82% overall response rate at the... Um, pediatric center in Moscow, a 90% over response rate. And then when we had a bispecific car, so these are single cars, right? And the problem with any single mode of therapy, just like, you know, combination drug therapy for HIV, a single mode of therapy for cancer is you get escape, right? The cells lose the 19 and guess what? Then the car against the 19 doesn't work. And in this case, we had a bispecific car targeting two antigens. We had a 92% complete remission rate. And after two years, only one relapse to date. 
right? So this is phenomenally transformative for these patients. And it shows the opportunity, I think, of using a very similar technology for HIV that we'll get into in, in just a little bit. Um, Boro, may I interrupt yeah. for a second? I just wanted to, to point out to everyone. So that machine that you were pointing out um, up there with Case Western, that's that's what we might know as the gene therapy in a box that Jen Adair was talking about? Yes, that's right. It's an all-in-one. Um, we think that there are alternatives that are a lot cheaper. I mean, this machine, you have to put the cells on it and wait for 14 days for the cells to come off, off of it. Um, so it occupies one machine for that whole period of time. There are other more modular ways to do it that will really decrease the cost. Also, this machine and its materials a single source leads to issues in terms of cost effectiveness to create these therapies. Again, that's what we're focused on, decreasing the cost using maybe alternative devices. But yes, that is the gene therapy in a box that um, Jen um, mentioned. Um, and so someone had a question in the chat also. They were asking, when you say point of care manufacturing, does that mean fresh CAR T cells or infusing fresh CAR T cells? Usually, yes, that's the preference because we know that CAR T cells that are fresh um, are better than frozen, right? When you freeze the cells, there are these subpopulations that are very sensitive to freezing. And these are the long lived cells, right? And so the preference is fresh in and fresh out manufacturing. But at the same time, you always got to leave the option to freeze because sometimes these cancer patients, they get an infection just before an infusion. You can't infuse the patient, you know, when they have an infection. So you always have to have the option to freeze in any protocol. But yes, we've seen the best results, fresh in and fresh out manufacturing. And having it locally allows to do that. You can't do that with centralized manufacturing. You have right. a better product, shorter time, shorter vein-to-vein -vein time, right? And it's on demand by the physician. Um, and, and the physician there also has options in terms of treatment options, in terms of scheduling, which is big. It's a big advantage for these personalized therapies. Wow. And so we have another question too. So this person writes, during the response to COVID-19, the FDA prohibited use of point of care diagnostics developed and manufactured by academic hospitals, reference labs, yes. et cetera. This was a huge change from decades of practice. The FDA is now moving to regulate such uh, point of care tests. What impact does this have on your products? Oh, absolutely. It's a sea change, right? Um, this is the mentality now that they realize the, the limitations and the weakness of the supply chain by having centralized manufacturing facilities. And so that's why I think COVID has been an education for all of us. And the, that's why I think the FDA is supportive of point of care across the board, whether it's diagnostics or whether it's manufacturing therapeutics, or, you know, I would even see you could even manufacture drugs, like as you saw in the in the in the booklet that I showed previously. So mm -hmm. I think a, this is a sea change, and I think one that we absolutely need, not only for in the United States for robust supply, but to disseminate these technologies all around the world, right? To make right. it better, cheaper for everyone, particularly in low middle income countries. So, so it's wonderful to see the sea change. Uh, we'll do everything we can to support it. Tom, I think you. I think this is a good thing. I think the FDA is realizing, as Boro yeah. has said, that there is this sea change and it needs to be regulated. So, I mean, I think it's a good thing. Yeah, it's a good thing. It has to be regulated. Yeah, you don't want it to have a unregulated. That's not a. That's not a good thing. The people at the FDA are are super smart. I've been working with them for decades, and um, they they they. Most important thing on their mind is safety, right? So they're going to be a little bit conservative, but they listen to any rational reason in order to, you know, accelerate release testing or or do whatever is needed for the benefit of the patient. So, so the, the one way to 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 manufacture the product in these sites that I mentioned to you is, you know, at the hospital. But when you have facilities at a hospital, each hospital is kind of different, has different regulations, different kind of protocols. So what's okay for clinical trials, we see ultimately point of care manufacturing by having a facility that's either on the parking lot of the hospital or very close to the hospital. And the reason for that is, is that you want to have identical units. Because only when you have identical units, you know, all across the country and around the world, can you reliably, you know, identical units, identical machinery, right? Everything identical, that's when you can actually get consistent product being produced, not in facilities that have variation. So we very much um, are partnering with, with companies like Germ Free to create these uh, mobile um, clean rooms that can be put either in the parking lot of a hospital or across the road or 
somewhere very close to manufacture the product. And, and we're developing processes to reduce the time, right? So typically your products are at least 14 days, the approved products. We did an eight day on the trial. We can now do six day and three day processing and one day is a possibility as well. Why would you ever want to send things centralized if you can make something, you know, in three days locally um, on demand at the hospital, you know, close to the hospital. So that's why we see this really as a future. But the key is identical point of care units and equipped equipment that's placed close to the hospitals. And each one of these units, they have a camera that records how the product is being um, manufactured. So a BLA holder or a regulator can see or review how a product is being made and all the data is uploaded into the cloud. And, and there is a hierarchical system that I'm not going to talk about that allows for remote release of the product while manufacturing the product locally with only a couple of people manufacturing the product. So you're your cost is very, very different. It's very efficient in terms of how you split personnel to manufacture the product and release the product. But I'm not going to go that, into that in any great detail here. So you know, it's also very been focused. very attractive, Boro, as, as you know, to these African countries where you know the the, the politics uh, um, is such that they would they would love to get these new technologies and have their countries involved in them. And you know we've. Uh, work through GGTI with UCSF to try and train investigators and stuff. So, I mean, this really is happening. So, yeah, okay. Absolutely. Yeah, no, it really can, particularly for low middle income countries, it, it could be a real game changer because those units don't have to just produce one product. They could be producing multiple different kinds of products, right? And really accelerate their ability um, in this advanced medicine space. Um, but, you know, Karen Cross, we're focused on making this cheaper, right, more robust, very, um, but focused on improvements on current therapies that are proven to work. We, we do work a little bit on the in vivo vector space. We have good knowledge on that, actually. Uh, targeting vectors is something that I've done in a past life. Um, but I, I think in terms of the next five-year horizon, we're really, if we can make this cheap and robust, I think we can help a lot of people, right? So, so that's what we're we're focused on, you know, partnering and creating value and impact with the proper structure and agreements, whether it's uh, devices or particles or our first company that we've created, Vector Biomed. I'll share a slide on that for you to, so you can see what we've done there. Uh, biologics, the medicines, the cells, and then the distribution mechanisms. And we're focused just on this, nothing else. We don't create vaccines. We don't do drugs. We don't do anything else. We're just focused on this singular problem here. So Vector Biomed. First company created out of nonprofit Caring Cross, just launched uh, January 2023. It's a public benefit corporation. So when we launched it, we put into the charter impact clauses to make sure that we can uh, not only make a good profit for our investors, but we can do the right thing. And we were very fortunate, actually, in this funding environment. It was very, very difficult. Um, but we found two great partners, Viking Global Investors and Kasdan Capital, that understood the business model, understood that a little piece taken for impact could make a big difference, and yet we could create a lot of value for the company, for them and their investors. Um, we moved into the old Lentigen space. So Lentigen moved out of the space. I'm very good with the um, the uh, the landlord there, and I said um, about a year and a half ago, have I got a business plan for you? So we uh, <laughs> leaped the Leased the the, uh, the the old Lantage in space. I've hired a lot of the people that were my former colleagues. Um, and we've got 14 people, you know, just January 2023, 14 people up and running and setting up the company and already getting clients uh, through the door. So, um, and, and our focus is really what the need is at the moment, rapid and premium lentiviral vector manufacturing solutions. So anybody that's out there that has a gene X and they wanna put into cell Y, that's all that we need to know. We will suggest different constructs and different manufacturing, the whole nine yards, because uh, that's the level of expertise that we have. We've been in this space for a long time. Um, so better quality vectors servicing the industry at a lower price. So everybody gets a little bit of a lower price, not too much, because you wanna be profitable, but and you wanna create a value for investors. But for our products, the caring cross medicines, we get a significant discount, right? So that then we can provide our medicines to low middle income countries at a low cost, right? And we also made sure that they, at least 10% of the capacity of Vector Biomed is dedicated to caring cross medicines. So that's the way in this situation, we carved out impact. We get a very discounted price for caring cross medicines and having the capacity so that we can then distribute it to hospitals at a low cost. So what about pipelines? We're a relatively small organization, but we have a, a lot of things going on, mainly because we partner a lot. 
So the anti-HIV duo car, that's our lead program that's in clinical trials at the moment. We're excited where we are with that at the very early stages. We're developing a triple anti-leukemia and lymphoma. Remember I told you about a double that addresses relapse. We have a triple now that we're very excited about. Um, uh, for sickle cell and beta thalassemia, you know that the Blueberg bio product, Lentiglobin or Zeltego works, but it costs $2 billion a pop. We can make it something for a tenth of the price, right? Even if it is stem cells. So that's our goal, uh, collaboration with the NIH. Um, and a multiple myeloma, we're developing its early stage of programs. We've got some programs in solid cancers and some other genetic diseases as well. So just a couple of slides. I think you've seen this before, but just uh, this is our lead program. And we are excited by it. We have a car um, that we call a duo car that targets um, the GP120 molecule on two parts of its surface, killing um, cells that express GP120, which are HIV-infected cells that are productively infected. And um, it has two mechanisms of action. In CD8 cells, the CARs act as killers. They bind to GP120 and kill cells that express GP120 on their surface. While in CD4 cells, this molecule in particular um, protects the CD4 cell from infection because when a HIV binds to it, it acts as a dominant negative fusion inhibitor, preventing entry. So we have both elimination of productively infected cells and protection of CD4 cells, which is the, you know, I think the, the most important aspects of it for a gene therapy. And just, the, I'm going to go straight to the animal studies. These are NSG mice that we first injected into the spleen, infected PBMCs, and then tail vein injected um, the uh, duocar T cells in the whole animal, complete inhibition of replication with our duocar and protection of the CD4 cell compartment in these whole animals uh, while depletion um, in the control animals. And I think this is the first time this has ever been shown that you both have complete inhibition and, comp and protection of the CD4 compartment in an animal model. So we're very excited about that. Um, manufacturing the cells is using the prodigy at the moment. We are transitioning to other methods. You're taking a, a participant, taking the leukophoresis product, manufacturing, adding the vector, and then releasing the product um, and infuse the uh, participant with the, with the product. And the clinical trial, we're at this stage. Um, we've been very careful, starting at a very, very low dose of cells, dose that we know is not effective in any CAR T clinical trial for oncology. We just want to establish safety and no lymphodepletion. Typically, lymphodepletion is something you always do with CAR T therapy in order to create space, in order to help the cells expand in the body, right? So we're a cohort one. And and I, I don't think we're going to we're releasing too many details, but I can tell you so far it's showing safety. Uh, we've had absolutely no adverse events, um, and um, we've seen some signs of activity. I think that we're very excited about. I can't wait to get to cohort two and cohort three to get at meaningful doses that could have some sort of a therapeutic benefit. But we'll see. That's why we run clinical trials. Um, and then um, all I want to show you is is that also for oncology. We've worked a lot in oncology, creating multiple targeted vectors. We think that's the future, a next generation CAR-T product. And this is just to show you our animal data for a multi-targeting CAR-T. It's a triple. It targets, you know, 19, 20, and 22. And what we have here is if you look at each one of these little, these are all little mice, right? These are all mice lined up, right? I think they're dead. And um, and these, and if, when it lights up like this, it's a tumor. So these animals are completely have a lot of tumor in them. And the types of tumor that we injected into them was these B-cell tumors that contain 19, 20, and 22 on their surface. But we also created knockout versions that either were eliminated for 22, eliminated for 19, or eliminated for 20, because we're mimicking relapse. We're mimicking loss of this antigen in the body, but we're just putting all four cell types de novo into the, into the animal. So when you, when you challenge these animals with just normal T-cells, well, the animals are blown away. When you have a monocar, typical like a CAR-19 approved product, and you and you you get relapse because you the cells that are 19 negative, you know these ones grow out. When you have a mono CAR, the 20 negative cells grow out. When you have a mono 22 CAR, well the 22 negative cells grow out. But when you have a triple CAR against all three antigens, nothing goes out. Right. So we're very excited about that. We're getting some very good animal additional animal data. We're moving very rapidly into the clinic. So just in summary, um, advanced medicines like CAR-Ts are transformative and curative in many cases in the oncology space. Point-of-care manufacturing improves efficiencies and lowers the cost of these kind of therapies. 
And I think we just began to scratch the surface of what we can really do there. Um, we developed technologies and candidates to lower the cost of goods to improve accessibility and affordability. We do that by partnering. Um, we have a lot of experience, not only on the Kerry Cross team, but on the Vector Biomed team. We have decades of experience. We've been doing this for quite a while. And it's that collective experience that we have here through our networks, um, through our board and advisory board on Kerry Cross that we're able to, you know, um, you know, I think have a very, very um, successful outlook here. Um, we partner with companies. We create new ones. We highly collaborative with hospitals and clinical development of our candidates. We in-license technologies. Um, and and uh, we've in-licensed some things from the NIH. We've in-licensed some things from other institutions. And we work with government to create standards. We have a collaboration with NIST and Nimble to create some standards uh, for the field of lentiviral vectors. And, and you know, our motto really is to partner, you know, creating value and improving access of these uh, transformative therapies. That's all. Thank you very much for your attention. I'd be happy to answer any additional questions that That's you may have. That's great. Before we do that, Bora, I, I kind of waited to this juncture, since this is our last meeting, to say thank you to everybody who has uh, helped DARE put these, uh, these sessions together. We've had um, uh, uh, collaborations with RID, with HOPE, with CRISPR uh, MDCs from the, you know, the NIH, the NIAID-funded groups. Um, and and people like, I mean, we've had two people from Caring Cross as far as presenters are concerned, but mainly we really want to thank the community people who have been very loyal to us since last June. I mean, this has been going on monthly pretty much since last June. We had a couple of holidays, but um, so thank you. There are some docs in the in the uh, in in attendance that have been with us a number of times that we've noticed, and we're really grateful to see them too. But really, we want to thank the community for really. Um, uh, attending and, and having such a great engaging, engaged interest in this topic. So I think next we're going to be doing um, uh, cure uh, therapies, research, whatever, in, as far as people who are aging and who are long-term survivors. So look out for that, but thank you. And with that, do we have any questions for Boro? We've got uh, like 10 minutes. Right. So I was going to say, if anyone has a question, please raise your hand. We can take you off mute so you can ask it directly. I'm looking through the chat. Um, uh, there is a question from Patricia uh, who wanted to know if you had a centralized Q&A that goes around to inspect your individual sites, such as the NIH's uh, IQA or the VQA, where you sent specimens for control testing. Yeah, that's the plan. That's obviously the plan. Re both remote remote quality release because they're viewing the product as it's being made, but also, you know, spot testing to ensure uh, consistency. And I just left in the uh, chat my um, email address. So if you do have any follow-up questions, I'd, I'd be very happy to hear from you and answer any additional questions you may have. Great. And Alistair, do you want to come off mute and ask your question yourself? Uh, I can. I have to scroll back so I remember the word. <laughs> No, early on, I'd asked if you were able or willing to publish required specifications for what such machines must do, the devices you were talking about, so that more than one manufacturer can make the required machines. Oh, yeah, absolutely. So this process that we're creating for manufacturing of the cells, we're just going to publish and make it open source. Okay, thank you. The, the other question, uh, very quickly, that, that, that had crossed my mind was in terms of those who choose or are willing to participate in your trials, in your human trials, do you have any um, any numbers, any demographics on the proportions from the various de demographic groups that show up uh, essentially to become participants in your trials? Mm, I don't have that detailed information. My clinical collaborators would have that. I'm sorry, I don't have that at my fingertips. Okay, and then very quick third question is, um, in the dim and distant past, I believe it was last millennium, um, I was one of the first three in a Sangamo uh, autologous stem cell gene modification trial. Wow. I, my sort of memory was that that actually used a viral vector to make the modifications. Is that similar to what you're doing or very different? Well, we're not knocking out things. We're not using like zinc fingers. All we're doing is adding genes in, which is a simpler technological you know, challenge than knocking things out. 
So, I mean, in in a, in a general basket, if you like, it's similar, but it has its, its own unique aspects. We're sort of building upon a really extensive knowledge in oncology CAR-T to develop a CAR-T for HIV that has all the attributes of the success that we've seen in the oncology CAR-Ts. And we continue to build that. Okay, thank you for an excellent presentation. No, thank you, appreciate that. Um, there were no more questions in the chat. Anybody have a question that they'd like to pose to Boro? Uh, can the CAR T cells enter the brain to attack tumor cells or HIV infected cells that might be there? And so, Boro, well, before you answer that, I was going to ask you to maybe um, give people an update on what, um, uh, uh, what, in other words, in the beginning of this, we had such a, a restrictive. Um, uh, criteria about who could be in the trial and why that is, because that'll go with the brain thing and and what we've seen and not seen in our participants so far. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the trial has now been a little bit more expanded um, to include um, um, additional criteria, but not necessarily to go on the structured interrupted therapy um, in order to be able to continue to attain data of of safety and efficacy. We'll only know if the therapy works if we do have the structured treatment interruption, but still um, I think a lot can be gained by having um, you know, a broader uh, cohort of, of, of individuals to be enrolled in the trial. So that's kind of been Steve's strategy and Murdad's, um, Dr. Murdad Abedi's strategy in order to um, accomplish our recruitment needs, but at the same time, get the data that we need so we can move forward. Because, you know, what we are at is the first generation vector here. It's very promising from the animal data, but we'll only know the deficiencies, if there are any, but the deficiencies of the vector in the clinical trial. So, and we we, we need to have the interrupted therapy in order to see the effects, but a lot can be gained even without interrupting therapy. I hope that answers your question. And and I think that I, what I was getting at was the toxicity that's been seen in in, in yeah. other populations as far as neuro, the neurologic. Oh, um, oh yeah, so that's been cars. seen in the oncology cars, but really generally with you know higher tumor burden um, and um, and uh, you know uh, so we actually haven't seen absolutely any toxicity with the the, the first participants on our trial. We're very happy so far. So. Um, you know, we'll increase the dose. We'll see where we're at. But so far, we've been very, very happy. Yeah, I think I that's very important. Yep. That's why we started with um, a low dose and 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 uh, no conditioning in order to first establish a good track record of safety. So, um, but I mean, these are very unique targets, you know, in, in oncology cars, you know, you're targeting antigens that are part of the host, right? So these are foreign proteins that we are targeting. So, you know, have, we have more confidence with this product, I think. Tom, do you want to unmute and ask your question? Thank you. And thank you, Boro, Boro for a, a really interesting, uh, inspiring presentation and, and a really innovative approach. Um, with, your, with your early phase clinical trials that involve humans, are there um, sites participating from low and middle income countries or, or is there a plan to, to expand these these trials to include them? Uh, do, can you speak a little bit to that, if you know? Absolutely. I can't talk about it because it's under confidence, but we are actively working with several low and middle income countries to expand trials. We Our strategy, though, is to get safety and efficacy data here in the U.S. We've always been very disciplined about that. Uh, but once we have safety and efficacy data, then we plan to move into low middle income countries to enable them. It is also a question of funding, you know, funding for the units. The, you know, we really believe in this uh, decentralized manufacturing concept. Uh, the units do cost um, about a, a million dollars each to implement. Um, so that's the funding that you need to order to implement local manufacturing. But once that's set up, we're trying to create a cost structure for the disposables and for the vector that it's very inexpensive in order to produce these products because you're relying on local labor, which is a lot less expensive than labor here in the US and in, in other high income countries. And there's actually training programs going on now and there's right. actually work with, with specific countries. So it's in, all in the hopper, Tom. Yeah. yeah, we're very excited and we feel very privileged to be able to work with these investigators in these countries. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? 
Wow, we're well, early. We've got two yeah. minutes to go. Michael, do you have any questions? Can um, we all thank Michael for all of his Herculean <laughs> efforts with the innovation and the technology since last yeah. June? Especially yeah, really. at a point when he was very sick. So yeah. thank you, Michael. For thank you, Michael. Stuff that I can't. <laughs> You're a superstar. Oh, thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Um, so there was one question, one last question, and they wanted to know about the CAR T cells getting into the brain to attack tumor cells or HIV infected cells. I don't know if you could speak to that. Yeah, T, T cells can go anywhere into the body. So we would imagine that they would, again, targeted to HIV infected cells or targeted to tumor cells. So it's wherever the T cells can migrate, we would imagine that these cells can migrate there too. Um, so, yeah. Sweet. Great, um, great, yeah. great. Anybody else? Michael, do you want to say any last words? Uh, no, I just appreciate this whole model. I think it's refreshing to have a different point of view when it comes to making these gene therapy products. I think I've just been getting so disheartened ever since 2017 and uh, Chimera, uh, Chimera, whatever its name was, the first one, the price, and I just see the price tags going up higher and higher and higher. And I think it's refreshing to know there's at least one group, there's one person, someone is working to make that go in the opposite direction and actually doing it in a way that anyone could see it making sense. You know what I mean? Like, it's not like some sort of strange Rube uh, Goldberg contraption of how you're going to do it. It makes sense. It's how you would do it if you were making any sort of product, whether it was baseballs or gene therapy. <laughs> it was a way to make it cheaper and making it sort of decentralized. And I just am really um, uh, inspired by that. And I think it for people who are working in the field, it should be an inspiration as well to show that there are other ways to think about this besides what we've seen as the predominant way so far. And I'm just hoping that it'll catch on for a lot more people. Yeah, boy, well, I've been beating up drug companies for 30 years about price. And I mean, these prices are not sustainable. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there, people will not be able to get the innovation if, if uh, without these these really wonderful creative ideas. So thank you, thank you, thank you. We love this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we can't have oh. these therapies just restricted to the few rich. It's unacceptable. Yeah. So, right. you know, yeah. thank you for this right. opportunity. Thank your father, to too, for instilling all this in you. Uh, yeah, <laughs> my, my dad's a trooper, no question about that. Yeah, yeah. so, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm very grateful to him. Great. All right. Well, thank you, everybody. Stay tuned for information on the next series that we'll be doing, again, about aging uh, and people that are long-term survivors So, um, as, as related to Cure. Thank you. Have a great day. And we really appreciate your loyalty to us since last June. Yes. <laughs> thank, thank you, you all. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you all. all. Wonderful talk. Thank you.